Chair, it's nine o'clock, and I believe we have all board members present. Okay, uh, ready to go. Okay, good morning. Uh, good morning to the June 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, second day of budget hearings. This is Tuesday, June 22nd. Uh, roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, item 28, uh, consideration of late additions, uh, revisions, or deletions for today. Are there any? Yes, uh, Chair McPherson, there is uh, one addenda. Uh, on the regular agenda, 34.1, we have an addendum. There's a closed session conference with labor negotiator, um, agency negotiators, county administrative officer, and director of personnel. The employee organization is all bargaining units. That concludes the additions to the agenda. Okay. We'll move to uh, item number 29, uh, budget manager's overview of land use and community services. Mr. Palacios, item uh, 29, is there any overview that uh, you wanted to add today before we get yes. to the agenda? Yes, um, Ms. Ms. Mallory will be giving the overview today uh, on today's budget, uh, budget categories. Okay, yeah, I'm glad she's still with us for another day at least, so. Yeah, she's gonna stay, she's gonna stay till the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm here. Good morning, Chair McPherson, members of the board, Christina Mallory, your county budget manager. So I believe Stephanie's going to share the presentation. We'll give you a brief overview of the uh, land use and community services section of the county budget. Next slide. So here you can see a breakdown of the financing provided to the land use and community services section of the county budget. It's about $216 million. Um, it represents about 24% of the county budget, uh, providing funding for public works, ag commissioner, parks, cultural services, planning and housing funds, library redevelopment agency funds and contributions to ag extension, the local agency uh, formation commission, LAFCO and the Monterey Bay Air Resources District. Next slide. Here you'll see a breakdown of the financing for each of them with a comparison to the prior year. Um, the financing summary includes um, Revenues primarily from the public works, uh, charges for services and intergovernmental revenues and other revenues, um, totaling about 185 million, uh, 22 million in fund balance, and 9 million in a general fund contribution, primarily for the parks and the planning department. Overall, the financing is reduced by almost 20%, primarily from the reduction in intergovernmental revenues and charges for services within the public works department as we continue to complete projects related to the 2016-17 winter storms. Next slide. This chart shows a breakdown of the general fund uh, changes for land use and community services. It's about uh, increase of about $1.8 million, which is primarily related to the increases required uh, within the planning department to offset the decline in overall permit revenues within the budget based on the prior year uh, actual trends. Next slide. This chart shows the decrease in expenditures for land use and community services overall about $53 million, primarily due to the completed storm damage work within public works and includes eliminating two full-time equivalent positions due to the transfer of those positions to the information services department offset by the funding of about four positions as departments make minor adjustments and have some minor increases in their overall revenues and operations begin to resume pre-COVID levels. Public works comprises about 70% of the total expenditures. And that concludes our overview. Um, and I'm available if you have any questions. Any uh, questions by, from the board? Okay, um, we'll get into the public comment of uh, the budget uh, later if necessary. Thank you, um, 
We will move to the um, action on the consent items uh, that are on the agenda today, items 35 to 40. Um, are there any public comment or let me see if there's any comments from the board first on uh, comments on the consent agenda. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll make a couple of brief comments if that's acceptable. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Uh, just some some brief comments first um, on the agricultural commissioner. Obviously, a lot of uh, appreciation for Juan's work and his entire team's work as supervisor Caput. And I uh, work together a lot on the agricultural issues of the South County. Um, Juan is a is a very uh, public and very reliable uh, face in regards to all the agricultural advocacy down there. And, and I've really appreciated having his ear and also having his advice on times that we've needed it during this last year. I don't think, I mean, the work with the agricultural community during COVID was a remarkable amount of work. And I think that that your entire team down there deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, just a brief comment also with the changeover, some of the changes that have been occurring at LAFCO with new staff coming on. Uh, Joe and his team have done a remarkable job this year as they always do. And I just uh, appreciate the work that LAFCO does for our community in general. Uh, in regards to the library fund, while uh, I just wanted to thank our Assistant County Administrative Officer Nicole Coburn for all of her work in regards to the libraries, both she and the entire team has been working overtime this year, it seems, with some of the new libraries that are coming online, but also just ensuring during COVID that our numbers were in line. So appreciation for her. And the last is just on the Air Resources District that I serve on with Supervisor Coonerty, and a lot of the work does go into Supervisor McPherson's district, but they've been doing a lot of work also during COVID with a lot more people being home and using uh, things that are creating additional emissions from the home. Uh, I, I just appreciate the work of the air district over the last year as well during COVID, uh, ensuring that the air within our area due to home-based emissions has been staying clean. So those are my brief comments on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, any other board member have uh, some comments on the consent agenda? Well, if I may, I'll just, uh, I won't repeat what uh, Zach said, but basically I want to thank uh, Juan Hidalgo for, and his staff for all the hard work they do. And uh, they also overlook uh, weights and measures, uh, which is uh, going over and looking at different uh, uh, products that are being sold and whether or not the public is getting what they uh, what they think they're paying for. I won't, well, I won't bring up the Skippy peanut butter uh, where they were <laughs> chipping uh, people for a, a one ounce of uh, peanut butter. But anyway, one and all goes on top of that. Thanks a lot. Very good, thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, any other comments from board members? I'd like to make a comment on item 38, uh, the library budget. I think this is a great opportunity to highlight uh, all of the tremendous work done by our library team in conjunction with Public Works and our library friends, uh, groups uh, throughout the county to build and or re renovate our branches. Uh, the new Felton branch uh, the, with the Jason Park, uh, the new Li Capitola branch uh, just opened last week. Uh, with La Selva Beach and other reno renovation projects are going on as we speak in Boulder Creek. Uh, and I think they provide a very visible demonstration of how much the community support for revenue measures can pay off. Uh, Measure S was passed in uh, 2016, and just four and a half years later, we already have a lot to show for it. Uh, I wanna thank our library director, Susan Nimitz, for her leadership. Another person who has announced that she is going to re retire. She, we've made tremendous gains under her leadership over the last five years. And once again, I appreciate all of the community members who have helped to raise money and awareness of our branches and their terrific program. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, a lot more opportunity for people to visit their libraries in, uh, throughout the county. And thank you very, very much for everybody who participated in that, that uh, endeavor. Any other members of the board have a uh, comment on the uh, consent agenda? Do we have comments from the public? Currently, yes, I do. And if I could just make a brief announcement before we start. Yes. Now is the time for public comment. This announcement will repeat in Spanish. Este anuncio se repetirá en español. If you would like to make your comment in Spanish, we have a translator available to assist. 
Speakers are limited to two minutes. At the end of your time, your microphone will automatically be muted. Members of the public may speak to an item on the consent agenda. To comment on a regular agenda item, the public will have the opportunity to comment after the item is heard. Ahora es el tiempo que la Junta de Supervisores recibirá comentario del público. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos un traductor disponible para asistir. Los ordenadores están limitados a dos minutos. Al fin de este tiempo, su micrófono será silenciado silenciará automáticamente. Miembros del público pueden hablar sobre cualquier tema de la agenda de consentimiento o de temas que no aparecen en la agenda. Comentarios sobre temas en la agenda regular se recibirá al fin de la presentación de ese tema. Thank you, Chair. And I have one speaker. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to talk to the board again um, about the face mask. Um, so a lot of us are getting together to speak to the um, County Office of Education and the different school districts around town. Um, there should be no face covering um, guidance um, of any kind for our kids this fall coming up on the, on the school year coming up. Um, so each of us has a lot of different um, experiences with this. A lot of the people who spoke last week at the County Office of Education meeting. Um, some were chiropractors, some were psychotherapists. We all have a different perspective. We all have children in the public school system and private school system. Um, there should be zero, um, any kind of guidance um, from any governmental agency regarding any kind of face covering. Um, it's very harmful for the children. Um, even last week, there was an article online on townhall.com. Some parents had sent in their kids a um, face mask to a lab to see what was in the face mask after their kids had worn these face masks for like six or seven hours. Pretty much there was everything in that mask except for viruses, interestingly. And then yesterday, we see that the WHO has now said, we don't think kids 12 and older should really be getting the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is just one indication of where these organizations that we look to for guidance backtrack. So I would really like for you all to, to think extremely clearly, extremely logically, look at the Constitution of California and the U.S. And let's get rid of all of these. Uh, it doesn't even make sense to have children wear face masks. It restricts breathing. It's just keeping toxins close to their nose and mouth. Um, so let's really get, let's get down to common sense here. And Let's get rid of all of these um, guidance that we're, we're restricting the breathing of our kids. Please talk to Ferris Sabah and Gail Newell about this today. Caller 1999, your microphone is available. And this is to address uh, items on the consent agenda, please. Good morning, this is James Ewing Whitman. It is June 20. Fourth, I'm pretty sure, 2021, can I be heard? Yes. Okay, you know, Carol brought up so many excellent topics for discussion. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm wondering why we don't have three minutes. Uh, by observation, now we're in some kind of calm before the storm. People who are vaccinated cannot wear a mask, but how can you tell who's been vaccinated or not? Maybe you're gonna be able to tell who's been vaccinated in a couple months, and that's really quite sad. Um, that's about all I have for now. Thank you very much for your time. There are no other speakers for public comment. Okay, um, um, return to the board. Uh, hey, Mr. Chair, I'll move. Consent, I'll move the recommended actions of the consent. Second. Koenig. Hi, Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Sorry. Aye. Thank you. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we go to item uh, 31 to consider approval of the 2021-22 proposed budget of the parks, open space, and cultural services, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined 
in the reference budget documents and is recommended by the county administrative officer. We have the 2021-22 uh, proposed budget, pages 233 to 244, uh, the uh, supplemental or the uh, proposed budget pages 245 to 246, and a supplemental budget uh, pages 267 and 68. I think our parks director, Jeff Gaffney, will be introducing this along with his uh, administrative services manager, Kim Nambi. Uh, Mr. Gaffney, welcome. Yes. Chair McPherson and fellow board members and CEO's office, thank you for having us today and for the opportunity to present our budget to you. Um, looking forward to our uh, new and exciting uh, fiscal year starting and, and wrapping up this one. Uh, it's, it's time to put it in the books as far as I'm concerned. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted to go next slide, please. Just quickly uh, reference our agenda for the day for, uh, I won't be here all day, I promise. Um, we're gonna go over the budget proposal, our operational plan achievements, and then we're gonna go over some emerging issues. I wanted to see, um, we were trying to get Kim elevated. She is now elevated. So I will go to the next slide and Kim will be taking over. Kim's our admin services manager um, and she has been with the county for a very long time and we're lucky to have her here at Parks. Take it over, Kim. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, so this is uh, the first parks dashboard shows all four of the parks budgets, parks operating budget, the CSA 11 budget, arts and public places, and the recreation and cultural services budget. Uh, the combined budget is down 9.5% from last year, primarily in the parks department operating budget. Next slide. Um, this slide shows just the parks uh, operating budget, Department 49, and uh, the expenditures here um, and revenues are down almost 600,000 from last year, primarily due to the end of the coronavirus relief funds, um, offset by some increased revenues for the coming year. Uh, on staffing, we are refunding one uh, previously defunded FTE recreation supervisor, but we still have uh, four unfunded positions or 8.33% of the total staffing. Uh, next slide. So here are the parks revenues in the recreation aquatics and park facility rental sections. Um, the black line uh, is for 18, 19, that was the last normal year. Uh, followed by significant revenue losses in 1920 when uh, COVID-19 pandemic began and 2021. Uh, we are estimating a recovery in 21-22, but not all the way to the pre-COVID levels. Um, and especially in aquatics, the revenues for 21-22 are also lower due to uh, the pool closures for deferred maintenance that are coming this winter. Next slide. Uh, Parks continues to pursue grants. Our success rate over the last four years has been between 25 to 40 percent of the grant, all the grants we are applying for. And we have already applied for over 16 million in grants to be awarded in 21-22. Next slide. So Parks is uh, expanding our program budgeting. Our departmental admin costs will be allocated proportionally to each section in the department in 21-22. And the recreation section is also divided into specific programs. We've refined those, uh, clarifying that the name summer recreation is really uh, outdoor education. That's what it's been used for and adding special events and fitness and health. Um, the recreation admin costs are also allocated proportionally to each of the recreation programs. Program budgeting improves tracking and accountability and is a step towards better performance measurement. And now I will uh, turn it back over to Jeff who continue with the parks objectives of the operations plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much for all the hard work you've done. This has been a very challenging year to budget in and uh, especially given all the different funding sources that we often use in parks. And um, it's just a, we're really lucky to have you. Thank you. 
Um, so moving along, we actually, surprising even to me, we were able to accomplish um, a lot of our operational objectives. And uh, one of those that was a highlight was way back when it did happen. Um, we actually opened Leo's Haven, which was part of Chanticleer's Park phase, uh, phase one. Um, we're actually working on phase two already, and uh, we have made it to the next round of a grant process for that. Um, and that's a really, a really good sign for us. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, so the others um, that we'll, we'll continue on is, is um, we moved towards a better forward facing organization, more social media interaction. We didn't really have a presence. Um, so we, we slowly developed a, a plan for how we can reach out to the community more uh, through social media. And then we actually said we wanted to increase social media um, by 25%. We actually are in the mid thirties, probably uh, closer to 40 that we've increased it. And I anticipate um, in the next year, we may even have doubled the amount of social media presence. So we'll continue to do that. Next slide, please. Um, we also took on a smart maintenance project, which we completed. Um, and the idea here was to uh, allow our, our op staff or folks that are out in the field to be able to get around the most efficiently way they can back and forth through our parks. Obviously, there's things like traffic and um, other types of obstacles for them to do that. So this was uh, how we get people to also do projects together, possibly work in the same vehicle. COVID did blow this up a little bit. Um, so uh, we still are working towards getting back in line with that smart maintenance project, but we did complete it before COVID started and um, we're looking towards um, improving on that. Some internships that uh, in the past, we had not been um, looking out for as many interns as um, I would normally expect to have in a parks department. And um, we we were already moving towards this in our operate, operational objectives when COVID hit, which was uh, one of the saving graces of COVID was there were a lot of people who didn't have internships suddenly. So we have had more interns than we've ever had before in our department this last year. And it's been a real benefit that we were ready for that. So next slide. Um, and then youth rec camp, uh, this, this changed so many times and in direct consultation with our health officer and other park professionals across the state, um, we were able to continue to create uh, camps for uh, children throughout our community uh, despite COVID. Um, so this actually fit in line with what we were already looking at, especially the outdoor component. Um, so that was um, very surprising that we were able to meet that objective, but we did. Um, and Simpkins pool maintenance, you'll probably be hearing about this over the next couple of uh, times we meet, um, but uh, we are working towards massive improvements to the pool. We're, we're over 20, we're pushing almost 25 years old um, for a lot of these facilities that were meant to last 20 years um, or less actually in some cases. So we are hoping to be done by December 20 of 22. Um, and we're gonna be uh, shutting down parts of the pool and facilities come December of this year to complete a lot of that. Um, so uh, look forward to that. We'll be communicating that um, in many different venues and sharing information. Um, next slide, please. So here are a couple of the emerging issues that are out there. I really um, am very aware your board has heard several times about some of them, um, one of which is our climate resiliency. And of course, being a parks agency and managing thousands of acres of parkland, um, forested parkland in most cases, um, this is a, re a really deep concern for us. And also natural resource management uh, in general is not something that our county parks department has taken on in the past. And it's something that when I arrived, I knew we would need to be looking at. So I'm really proud that we actually are now focusing more and more on both climate resiliency and natural resource management. Most recently, uh, a large scale project taking place at Energy and Cummings and several smaller scale projects that we'll be looking at throughout, uh, throughout the county park system. Um, outdoor recreation um, is something that I think everybody has seen the increase in use of outdoor recreation um, and getting into our parks, parks that are close to home, parks that are a little farther away. And um, it's unprecedented actually in my 30 years, the amount of use that's occurring. Um, a lot of that does take some infrastructure and uh, resources from the agency. So we just have to be thoughtful about that. Um, next slide. 
So um, some of the items we also want to be thinking about are our capital needs. Um, and those capital needs are highlighted here. Um, the, the, the first four actually we're in progress of, of working on, as I mentioned, Simpkins, and, and we're also looking at taking care of Highlands and Hidden uh, Beach and, and the Vets Hall. Um, and then the rest of them we're trying to program in, um, and that'll be something I talk about as well in the, in the next time we meet. So next slide, please. I wanted to go over a little bit of the disaster response. Um, it was um, it was humbling to see the amount of cooperation and collaboration between all of the staff and all of our different departments um, within the county. And it, it truly was an honor to be a part of this organization and watch us work as closely as we did with each other. Um, there is no higher calling in my mind for people than to serve others and in public service. That is the, the absolute key goal um, to be serving the community. And um, also at times they were serving other peers and, and coworkers and other folks from other agencies. So I, I know that the board has heard about this in the past, both um, at our department level and other departments. But again, I want to commend our staff and the staff who worked with them um, to do some of the things you see highlighted here on the screen. Um, and um, I, I was, again, just felt so lucky to be a part of this organization and the county as a whole um, as we went through all the different disasters and, and the responses that we shared. Next slide, please. So um, as part of that, we've come out with uh, some longer term partnerships um, and we're going to continue to strive um, to build those partnerships. Those were so important as part of the pandemic, as part of our disaster response that we developed these partnerships and we relied on them strongly and I hope to continue to build them. Uh, there are so many partnerships uh, that we built outside the agency that I, there were too many to list on the screen here. Um, but um, I look forward to um, working with them individually and collectively. Um, next slide, please. So I know that uh, the board is busy and has a lot of uh, a lot on the agenda today. So I tried to quickly go through things here um, and I would actually recommend that you approve the proposed budget. Um, and here are the reference pages as listed out. And um, I'm also now going to have us stop sharing the screen and take questions or comments. Um, I know that it's been a very challenging and interesting time for all of us. Um, and you may have a lot of questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daphne, uh, for your tremendous leadership and to the whole parks team. Uh, really, you did step up and above um, everything that could have been expected of you. Uh, I just want to thank you and the entire team for all its hard work for not just running our uh, terrific park system, but for all your efforts during the uh, COVID pandemic and the CZU fire and responding uh, where you could to help people who were in need. And there were many of them, hundreds, thousands of them. And one important thing that COVID did remind us of uh, is that parks and open space are not just nice to have around. They are essential for our health and well-being. Uh, Really, the, the improvements uh, to our park system in recent years has also been tremendous. I, I mentioned the Felton Library earlier, uh, which was made even more special with the adjacent Felton Discovery uh, Park, an inter interpretive park that uh, is one of a few of its kind in the United States, uh, side by side with the library. Uh, that teamwork, working with the library system and the park system to make a tremendous facility uh, is really uh, over the top. And um, either one of those improvements was re re was important on its own, but uh, to have two facilities side by side has uh, been so welcomed by the San Jose Valley residents in my fifth district. Um, I also want to thank the Parks Department for the work you did on behalf of the underserved youth in the San Jose Valley, uh, it's, uh, specifically, and you did that throughout the county. It's worth highlighting uh, all of the cultural services uh, provided through the department's support of our community and nonprofit organizations. And I really applaud you for your aggressiveness and getting going out and getting grants and having the applications out there right now as we speak. Uh, I think we're going to see some real good results from that. So uh, thank you to you and the whole parks team for a tremendous year under some difficult times. Uh, very much appreciated by the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Fred, do you have a comment? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Gaffney, and also to um, Ms. Hurley for all of her work over the last year. I think that uh, to build a little bit on what the chair said, over the last year we saw an explosion in the usage of parks. And what we haven't seen is a subsequent uh, commiserate amount of funding for parks or staffing. In fact, uh, you have less staffing now than you did before the Great Recession, a point that was made yesterday by the CAO. And in fact, over the last nine years or so that I've been on the board, I know that we've added a couple of positions, but over time, as people retire, those positions are held vacant in order to deal with some of our financial issues, but yet the parks continue to expand in both need uh, from an equity perspective and programmatic need, as well as an actual uh, need for remodels and actual need of size. And in this last year, even during COVID, while you were with very few maintenance workers trying to maintain what we had, you were also working with local nonprofits, funders, and others to help improve things such as this hidden beach in my district, which is getting a significant remodel and becoming accessible to more kids with some of the poor in play and other options that are being taken there. And then the work that'll be happening at Willowbrook Park, thanks in, in part to you, Rebecca, as well as the CAO for that, as well as some of the improvements we saw down at Pinto Lake Park. I just don't think that people recognize how much really happened over the last 12 months. Uh, time didn't stop for you in any way, shape or form. And even with less money and less resources, the need for the parks, it became a real lifesaver for people to get outdoors as Supervisor McPherson was saying. Uh, but you are investing in things even with very limited resources and finding ways and partnerships with the Coastal Conservancy, with uh, local funders and other nonprofits and the Friends Group, which has been remarkable to maintain a sense of place. I mean, the reason that people want to live here is because in large part because of parks and open space. I mean, access to the beaches, access to parks, green belts and other, other uh, places. And, and uh, you and your very small team has been very nimble and very agilely doing exactly this. And as uh, one of the parents on the board, I have to say my six-year-old, um, I mean, his life surrounds, is basically around these parks. I mean, the parks in my district are something that he spends a minimum of five days a week at. And he's developing memories and a love for the outdoors and for parks in a way that you can't put a price on. So the work that your team does really does shape uh, our youth, provide equity and provide access. And, and you should be uh, commended for that. And, and I know that this is not the investment that we need in our local parks in this budget. I recognize that. And I know that there will be an ask of us in terms of uh, some of these additional fees. And I think that that's a reasonable discussion to have. I think that we need to find a stable mechanism for funding these parks moving forward. And I think what you're proposing is definitely one step, but I don't think is the only step as Supervisor McPherson said last week in doing that. It's been an underinvested in department in my opinion. And uh, just based on the community desire to access it, I think that we need to be sure that we uh, commit to that investment moving forward. So I'm looking forward to the changes that are going to happen this year. And, and uh, in all of our districts, there's improvements occurring in parks that are exciting. In some cases are once in a generation type improvements. So thank you to you and Ms. Hurley and, and for everybody else on the team, Kim, for keeping the numbers going in a way that even us elected officials can understand. I appreciate the presentation from both of you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Gaffney. Um, yeah, certainly I, I, I agree. We couldn't, we, we all appreciate our parks more than ever in the last year. Um, and you, of course, chalked up some real wins with opening new facilities. Uh, Leo's Haven Park uh, off of Chanticleer is very well loved in the first district, um, as is the new heart of Soquel Parkway, um, a really great way um, to experience nature in the heart of uh, Soquel Village. Um, and I'm excited to see some of the new investments, particularly in the Simpkins Swim Center. Um, I think, uh, you know, while both the boiler and the water slide and the decking all needed, uh, I'm sure the water slide will be uh, most most noticeable and, and um, appreciated by visitors there. Um, and of course, also the, the new Live Oak Library Annex at the Simpkins Swim Center. I think investment um, in that as a community center is really gonna pay off in the long run. Um, you know, also to Supervisor Friend's point, I uh, just want to acknowledge how um, entrepreneurial enterprising you have to be as a department. Um, and, uh, you know, both with the fact that 40% of all the financing comes from uh, use of money and charge for services, uh, as well as all the grants that you have to go out and get and just, you know, commend you on that effort, um, as well as uh, say, uh, you know, agree that we need to find more ways to increase your funding long term. 
I was just curious, looking through um, the budget, I know we, you know, of course, the, our last full meeting of the board, uh, we voted to increase development fees. Um, is that represented in this budget um, under revenues and, and taxes with the $48,000 increase? Or is it is it not yet accounted for? It's not yet accounted for. We'll be talking about that um, on the last day, the 29th. Um, we will complete the action that we started. With the, we'll close the hearing, hopefully successfully on that. Um, and then after that, we will have any discussion that you want on the fees that we will suggest at that time. So um, there is no final answer on the fees. And that's a determination you as a board get to make on the 29th. Okay, great. Um, and then as I mentioned, um, and you're well aware, you know, essentially 40% of your revenues are coming from charge for service or, or use of money. Um, do you see uh, other opportunities to e expand those kind of revenues or opportunities um, you know, for new recreation services to the public that you know, essentially would be offering at below market rate, but uh, offer an opportunity to earn some revenue for the department? I, we're always looking at creative new ways to um, develop revenue. We also have to worry about equity. Um, that's always a, a really big challenge for us in this community. Um, and we have a very a deep divide oftentimes between um, the haves and the have, not, have nots. Um, and so, for example, just who gets to visit the beach um, and how they get there. If we were to charge, um, you know, in some beach communities, they're charging $20 an hour, literally, for parking. Um, and or it's, uh, you know, down in Southern California, sometimes it can be 40 or $50 a day to park. Uh, we don't do that in Santa Cruz County. And we... Um, we're proud of that. That's so that anybody can afford to, to drive to the beach and, and enjoy a day. And a lot of our access points that we have, um, we are working as part of our encroachment program to develop revenues to help, you know, build out the infrastructure um, and do some repairs and improve the access. But that doesn't cover the actual operational dollars. Um, so I think there are opportunities for us to look at equitable charges that we can do. Um, that is going to be have to be hand in glove with the Coastal Commission and um, their staff in how we look at that. Um, I think that's a conversation as well that uh, may be needed to have had with Department of Public Works. Um, I also think there's opportunities for us to do things um, with more events and activities in parks. Um, this is a concern for me that as we come out of the pandemic, um, we are absolutely one of the most um, uniquely hit um, agencies in the county because of the pandemic. Because as you pointed out, we generate our revenue and have generated a lot of the money that we use from our events, like weddings, like birthday parties, activities that people were not allowed to do, concerts. We did smaller concerts, you know, all those types of things. And so we're going to have to be more innovative and more creative. Um, we are in this um, budget. We are. Um, looking towards how we can invest in those activities a little bit more and uh, possibly things like community gardens, which can really be a huge benefit for the community and also can generate a, a modest amount of revenue. Um, it's, it's a whole cadre of things. In addition, we did make an investment uh, uh, last year and as part of this budget that we're finally implementing um, of hiring a, a supervisor over the events and activities and reservation section. And that's, we've never had that before. Um, and that is a very strategic focused effort for us to try to generate more revenue in an equitable fashion. So I have a lot more thoughts as everybody usually knows when I talk, um, but um, I'm happy to talk more. I, I hope that answers a little bit of what you're asking. Yeah, definitely. I'm um, excited to see uh, more weddings, concerts, and other social events. Um, and it's great that we're making an investment, as you said, um, in, a, in a supervisor uh, for those kinds of events. Um, I also noticed that youth recreation programs are taking a major hit this year with a 71% drop. Um, is that just because they were uh, one-time funding we saw for COVID for the outdoor youth recreation programs that is now going away? Or um, is this more of a long-term problem? Yeah, that is um, absolutely whether we can generate. So based on this fiscal year that we're in currently, the amount of revenue we truly generated was very minimal um, because we were using CARES Act funding and ARP funding now. Um, so the ARP funding will help us. Um, we will use some of that to get through next this, this coming fiscal year that's part of this budget. Um, but again, that goes back to the revenue generation and the youth rec programs are one of those, we bring in a dollar and we pay a dollar and that, you know, those are such on the thin line of, of being able to create 
uh, enough revenue to keep them going um, that they often are the ones we look at first because it, it's exactly what we've been talking about. Um, are we going to be able to generate the activities that we were not able to do under COVID um, enough to generate enough of that revenue to keep them going? It's it's sort of a um, you know a closed loop on that one. And and so yeah, good good eye to catch that. Um, that's exactly one of the areas that I'm most concerned about. Okay, yeah. Um, hopefully we can bring those back more in the future. I mean, it's so essential to connect uh, kids and, and youth with the outdoors early to build that relationship. Well, and we and just uh, we are partnered with County Park Friends, and they are actually doing events for us for you know as a a, a part of their service to us. So they have been doing outdoor education events and taking kids um, um, on coastal exploration courses and science classes. And um, so I, I don't expect them to take over the load for us, but they have augmented us, and we'll continue to do that as we get back on our feet. Yeah, they've definitely been a great partner. And I also like the, the parks internship program that you're developing. Um, I'm just curious if those are the paid or unpaid interns and uh, you know, kind of what next steps are for, for folks who go through that internship program. Oh yeah, thank you for highlighting this. Um, they are both paid and unpaid actually. Um, where we have been able to afford it, we can and we will. Um, but we, we ended up having so many interns interested that we did do unpaid um, and the interesting thing is uh, we have all of the different facets of government work in addition to the the normal outdoor natural resource management type function. So as an internship, this department offers anything you can imagine. You know, we have a planning arm, we have an operations arm. And uh, of course, this is a great way for us to invite um, young professionals who are interested in in maybe a different, they might even be never thought about government before, but uh, they come work for the parks department and suddenly they might be interested in working for government um, or they may be interested in um, some aspects of government and we have the opportunity to give them an understanding, a better understanding of what it's what it's like to truly work in an organization. Um, and it could be people that are just interested in, you know, I, I wanna save the environment and we have an opportunity for them to do that and then they get a real life understanding of what it is to, to do the day-to-day -day operations of that kind of activities that actually make a difference. Um, so the internship program is something I've wanted to do as well, like I said, from day one. And having that energy also, I think oftentimes invigorates our workforce um, and reminds them of part of what who they used to be and why they came into the department. So I, it's a, just a, a tremendous benefit to have the organization. Yeah, it sounds like a fantastic program. Great, that, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a lot of my questions were uh, covered by the previous supervisors. I wanna thank the Parks Department uh, for developing the after school programs, especially during distance learning. It was critical for socialization and just to give parents a break uh, as well. Um, and they're really important. I will say on the RECS programs, what I'm seeing anecdotally, at least around like the sports and theater leagues that uh, uh, sports leagues and theater programs that my kids are involved in is there's insane demand right now because everybody's ready to get out. So sort of erring on the side of offering more, even if there's a little risk there, I think is a worthwhile um, opportunity because I do think, I do think people by the fall, especially are gonna be ready to have their kids engaged in and back doing things, uh, making up for lost time and in, in activities. Um, and then finally, uh, looking at the budget, I know we had to put on pause. We had the, the effort to really try to um, build some more inclusivity into our uh, parks and rec programs uh, through our funding structures and um, holding spots and other, other opportunities. Uh, we put it on hold because COVID sort of blew up everything, but um, I look forward over the next year to get, getting back to that conversation, working with the friends and figuring out how we can really uh, make sure that our parks programs are serving all kids and reducing all the barriers uh, that might prevent them from, from signing up. I look forward to that as well. Roger, uh, Supervisor Caput, any comments? Yeah, you bet. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman uh, McPherson. Yeah, how you doing, Jeff? Good. Good. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the attention you've been given to South County and 
coming down here and we're, we're thinking outside the box. We're trying to make things fit. And uh, it's uh, nice to have all the attention. Uh, let's see, I lost you on the screen here. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. You're still uh, visible and I can still hear you. Okay, okay. Anyway, uh, one, uh, one question was uh, answered when uh, Supervisor uh, Kune got uh, asked it, so I won't uh, go over too much on it. But uh, equity and affordability uh, go hand in hand. If, uh, if we have a facility and uh, only people with money can afford to go there or, or uh, take advantage of programs, and uh, then uh, people without money can't. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the, you get it and the county gets that. We, we understand that. And I want to thank you for that, especially for people in South County. Uh, I noticed with the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the lifeguard training in the summer, uh, my son uh, uh, went three years uh, to lifeguard training. And uh, there's uh, three different programs because uh, uh, you have a state beach, you have a county beach, and then you also have city beaches. So there are three different programs. Uh, they're wonderful programs, and uh, they do have scholarships if uh, people can't afford them, which is really good. Um, and public safety and uh, uh, parks, uh, in a lot of ways, go uh, hand in hand. Uh, I know uh, with my son when he was doing the uh, lifeguard training uh, and uh, he became a teenager and everything, uh, after he was done in the, the, you know, Monday through Friday with all that training, uh, he'd come home tired and all he wanted to do was uh, really rest and stay at home. Uh, he wasn't going out and looking for trouble anywhere. So anyway, parks are really important. Okay. And then uh, homeless shelters uh, somewhat took over our uh, basketball uh, uh, courts at the uh, Veterans Memorial buildings, and uh, that that's been a lot of work. But a lot, you know, losing losing uh, an actual recreational facilities. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other thing I would uh, like I'd like to mention is. Uh, if we can get more collaboration between the schools and the parks. Uh, I know down here in South County, uh, a lot of money was spent on putting up fences and basically locking people out of the school facilities, uh, school yards, school playgrounds. Uh, so we need to uh, actually open those up, especially during the summer or after school or on weekends. and. Uh, uh, how, how are we doing on that? Are we getting any uh, cooperation from the schools? Do you know? Yeah, that uh, tends to be um, special districts or school districts, as as you recognize, have their own jurisdiction. And um, working with them is definitely individual to the different school districts, depending on what agency. So, um, it, yeah, it, it's absolutely determinate on which district and how what policies they've adopted. You bet. Okay, and I guess uh, uh, basically uh, we're looking very closely, and I'm sure everybody is, uh, at park uh, land acquisition and open space, uh, which uh, when you start losing it, then you appreciate what you had, open space, parks, and whatever. I, I noticed on reading a lot of things, uh, uh, when they do surveys, what makes people um, really like their community that they live in. And they always mention, especially uh, couples that have children, uh, they mention the, the schools in the area and number two or three is always uh, parks and uh, open space. So uh, that's it's really important. Uh, uh, people don't talk too much about it, but uh, whenever they do a survey, they indicate that they do like uh, having a nice uh, park in their neighborhood. So anyway, thanks a lot, Jeff. I'm looking forward to continue to work with you on uh, different ideas that we have for South County and uh, the rest of uh, Santa Cruz County. Take care. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, do we have any comments from the public? There are no members of the public commenting on this item. Okay. Again, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the extra effort that your department employees have put in to make uh, life as, as uh, good as it can be under the conditions. It hasn't been easy for anybody, but you put in the extra effort. Uh, and please uh, sincerely thank them uh, for their efforts because I think it helped a lot of people get through this COVID pandemic in the last year, as well as the fires that we've had. Uh, very important aspect of what we do in county government. And thank you again for your aggressiveness and going after grants and we'll try to, oh, there's a, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll try to do what we can to help out a little more as well in the county. Um, do you have a motion to accept the, uh, the parks budget? Yeah, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Is that second by Coonerty? I didn't see. Okay, uh, friend, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Gaffney. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to item number 32 to consider the approval of the 2021-22 proposed budgets for the planning department and housing funds, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents as recommended by the County Administrative Officer, we have the 2021-22 proposed budget, pages 247 to 254, also pages 255 to 258, and a supplemental budget, pages 69 and 70, the last two uh, in reference to housing. Mr. Uh, see who, uh, we're gonna, uh, Kathy is going to be presenting on this. Kathy Malloy and Maya Levine, I believe. Kathy. Probably I, I'm here. Okay. We can, hear, I can, we can hear you. I don't know where the picture is. Well, maybe I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, as you're aware, I'm retiring in August, and so I'm going to use this opportunity to just open up the budget presentation and then introduce other key members of the management team who will actually make the budget presentation. Um, and before doing that, I want to, you know, extend my deep appreciation for the dedication and resilience of every single person on the planning department team over this past year um, as they've met the challenges and continue to provide services. And um, so if Someone is bringing up the PowerPoint. Um, I'm not sure where. Our, uh, Melody was going to be supporting our team with the PowerPoint. Right. So this is a good time, Melody, to, uh, to share your screen if you can. She should be rejoining shortly. Whose cat is that? Is that Paul's oh, pious, I guess. All right, thank you, Melody. Um, all right, if you could advance to the first slide then. I'll be, um, in terms of the agenda, as I said, I'm gonna open it up and just uh, present the budget dashboard. And then Assistant Director Paya Levine will uh, review last year's activities. And then uh, Principal Planner Stephanie Hansen, who's with the Sustainability and Special Projects section, will review the operational plan achievements. Susanne Say, the Principal Planner with Housing, will review some of the housing achievements. And then it'll be back to Paya to talk about next year's program focus of um, continuing operation of the permit uh, recovery permit center. And of course the, the special um, focus on uh, the unified permit center and PRIMO uh, uh, permit processing improvements. And so if you could go to the next slide, uh, this is the budget dashboard. You'll see that um, Revenues are showing as fairly stable. The increase in general plan contribution um, looks pretty significant because as of course it's showing restoration in this these numbers of half the furlough. Obviously we now know that we'll be restoring the entire furlough. What the 
fiscal year 2021 numbers do not reflect is um, just under a million dollars that actually did get amended into our budget to support the initiation of the Repurvic, uh, Recovery Center um, to assist the uh, survivors of the CZU fire. Uh, the other notable aspects of our budget next year is we are um, able to fund uh, two positions that had been unfunded due to early retirements last year. So those we're bringing back and filling the two building permit technicians um, and that should uh, very much increase our uh, capacity at the building counter. Um, in terms of revenues, um, we base our revenue projections on the averages of what has occurred over the last three years, as well as known future more significant projects that are in the pipeline. Um, and so with that, I think uh, if we could advance to the next slide and Pia Levine will take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like to start by focusing on the operational aspect of the planning department and give you a brief description of the services that we provided in the last year um, out of the permit center. The context for those services is that our, um, the demand for our services has continued to increase. Here are just two examples. Building permit applications overall were up more than 15% and code compliance service requests were up uh, more than 20% year over year. And the code compliance side of what we do is very important to the people who use it. So I um, wanted to just highlight that for you. Next slide, Melody. A hallmark of our work over the last year has been the continued switch to being fully electronic and using much less paper through our department. We do two kinds of electronic permits, what we call the online permits. Um, those are permits that don't require plans, so they're the smaller kinds of permits, and the public can set up an account, make application, print their own permit card, pay their fees, and be on their way without any uh, interaction with planning staff. Those are um, very helpful to us. Not only is it convenient for the applicant, but those smaller permits are taken out of the pathway of the other more complicated permits. And so then those other permits have fewer, um, there are fewer uh, applications routing and we can give them kind of a clearer runway. Um, those permits that require plans, we they come in through the e-plan portal. Uh, that portal was uh, homegrown. It was written by ISD and it was tested mightily since um, since the switch to complete electronic purpose uh, processing. It happened very suddenly uh, after COVID and our team has focused on uh, uh, making incremental improvements to it. As it was tested, we would um, respond by trying to make the, the uh, portal function better for the public when they are uploading their plans. Next slide, please. Remote services um, extended to more than just the building permits. I'd like to highlight for a moment the zoning information and the building information that we did via email last year. We essentially set up a virtual public counter. And um, part of it, especially the zoning um, email, which we call Zmail, was very popular. Uh, we did about three times the amount of uh, queries and interactions that we would have had at a face-to-face -face counter. I think that was partly the convenience, but also the product of a, when you make a query to this email, you receive a researched written response. And I think the public really appreciates that. Um, and you get that response. They were pretty much holding to uh, a couple of days, one or two business days. So um, we expect to maintain some level of that as we go back to um, you know, business as normal or our hybrid business in the fall. Um, and as you know, we were among the first in the state to have our uh, planning commission and of the other hearing bodies we support be completely remote. So that was very much a focus of all of the staff over the last year. Um, Kathy introduced Stephanie, the Principal Planner of Sustainability and Special Projects, and I'm going to hand off to her to talk about the operational plan and um, more. Thank you. Good morning, board. Thank you, Paya. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. 
thank you. Um, we wanted to just take a minute to go over some of our operational and program pro programmatic successes um, from the last year. Um, by the end of 2019, uh, 2021 operational plan cycle, the planning department had achieved nine of its 14 objectives, six of which are highlighted on this slide. Major inroads were made in housing financing and planning for all modes of transportation, um, including the development of the draft uh, circulation element, which the board will see coming forward in the sustainability update. Um, key developments this year included the Dominican Hospital expansion, um, the uh, Capitola and 17th Mid Pen project, the uh, medical office building uh, on SoCal Avenue, which is currently out for public comment after release of the draft EIR. Uh, Pippin 2, an affordable uh, housing uh, development in South County of 80 units. Um, and currently beginning processing is the East Lake Village redevelopment. There were 59 permits issued for ADUs last year, an increase over 60% over baseline, and 66 permanent uh, housing units were legalized um, under that program. Next. Um, last year, economic recovery uh, during COVID and shelter in place orders was a huge um, focus for us last year. After the board passed the urgency ordinance allowing the planning department to administer uh, temporary permits on, on a um, an expanded basis, we also then came back with a uh, a, a streamlined permit process and new ordinance um, to allow temporary per, uh, uses to remain on site and those expansions to remain um, from for three years and up to six years. Um, 43 um, uh, folks applied for temporary use permits, 39 were issued and our most popular um, uh, permits were outdoor dining, um, bar and uh, dining uses, and the second most popular was uh, gym. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, last year, we also saw the um, uh, limited density owner built rural dwellings uh, code come before you. And um, this was the uh, K code. Um, this was uh, alternate building code for, for rural developments. It would help property owners um, up in the more rural areas of the county. It was a three year pilot project um, and it allows for uh, the use of alternate materials as well as um, fewer inspections. So we're looking forward to that as a uh, program to help people rebuild after the fire. Next. So uh, we also wanted to look ahead um, a little bit um, and talk about some of our programs of sustainability um, efforts, fire recovery, housing, um, the permit process improvements, particularly related to the uh, Unified Permit Center. Next. Um, so this year we're coming back before the board shortly actually in August with the new accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, this is in order to align ourselves a little bit better with the recent um, guidebook that's been uh, released by the state HCD. Um, so we'll be tweaking our regulations and addressing some of the standards including the numbers of ADUs that are allowed on a given site um, and reviewing the parking standards, particularly in the coastal zone. Um, later in the year, we'll also be working on the tiny homes ordinance as um, provided by the board, um, including tiny home villages and tiny homes on wheels. Um, this affordable solution will require changes to the county code, but will also be associated with a robust, a robust public input process. Next. 
Um, and we also have this sustainability update uh, coming before the board. Um, we are working um, uh, feverishly on uh, uh, the draft EIR at this point and in finalizing the draft amendments to the um, general plan and county code. Um, as, as you all are aware, the purpose of, of this is twofold, to uh, implement the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan that was um, uh, accepted by the board in 2014, and also to do a series of code modifications to uh, help with um, streamlining the permit and development uh, process. Um, the uh, timeline is uh, that we're working with right now is to um, release the draft EIR and the draft amendments for public review by the end of the year, um, do a series of, again, robust um, community uh, meetings to um, help people understand what's in the amendments, and then um, and that would be in the spring, and then move forward into adoption by June of next year. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Suzanne to talk about some of our housing initiatives. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Um, as you may uh, be aware, we have two major new affordable housing projects currently in um, uh, various stages of development here in the county, one in North County, one in South County. Um, the 17th and Capitola Road project uh, recently broke ground on their site work and the two clinics that are in the front of the project. Uh, the housing itself, we are currently partnering with the development partner Midpen Housing to help them complete their financing package, um, working on obtaining tax credits uh, for the development of the project and anticipating that they will uh, begin construction in 2022. Uh, the Atkinson Lane project, also known as Pippin 2, uh, just outside of Watsonville, is currently in the final stages of design, and it, we expect to bring the final designs for board review um, uh, in several months. Um, next slide, please. We also have a uh, home buyer project underway. As you may recall, we have a Habitat Humanity project on Harper Street in Live Oak. And um, two, the first two homes are scheduled to close escrow to be sold to low-income buyers uh, within the next several weeks. We're currently working with Habitat on that and also their efforts to market the homes and screen families for the remaining nine homes in the project. Um, we are also working with mid Penn Housing on a uh, rehabilitation of, uh, of uh, property in South County, uh, which has 18 uh, rental units, which are primarily occupied by farm worker families. Um, next slide, please. Housing, uh, another workload, uh, major workload component in housing continuing into next year is grants management. Um, over the last 18 months or so, we have uh, over uh, $13 million in grant funds flowing through housing division. The majority of those funds are for COVID rent relief programs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, going into next fiscal year, we anticipate additional opportunities arising for uh, disaster relief, both related to the CZU fire recovery and also potentially further pandemic recovery funding opportunities. Uh, staff will also be uh, continuing to work with the Housing for Health Division on efforts um, to rehouse uh, folks who've been in the Project Room Key hotels uh, and other um, permanent supportive housing efforts. Farm worker housing is an ongoing effort uh, that we're partnering with various folks on. And also the um, final disposition of the final uh, redevelopment property at 7th and Bromer is another major project uh, next year. And with that, I'll hand it back to Paya. Thank you. 
Moving forward, I'd like to talk for just a moment about the Recovery Permit Center. As you know, the Recovery Permit Center is a key part of our efforts to uh, get building permits to the fire survivors as quickly as we can. The, um, our fire was in August, and in September, we were initiating um, conversations with for Leaf, which is the consultant that um, has set up our recovery permit center. We were in contract by November and then um, in business downstairs in the community room on December 1st of this year. The recovery permit center model is based on um, kind of a personalized consultation service with attention paid to the front end of the process as much as possible. Um, we devised a pre-application screening process so that we could solve problems before applications are in the system and applications once they're in do go through very quickly. Among other things, the um, staff in the RPC has a firm commitment to accepting only complete plans. And that also has been very helpful and is one of the several things that the planning department is looking at in the recovery permit centers model as um, uh, something that we might adopt in our regular permit process. As of um, about 10 days ago, the recovery permit center had issued more than 250 fire related building permits has uh, has had more than 800 pre-application screenings and other informational appointments with um, with the public. And um, of those permits, 25 are single family dwellings, either issued or in the status where they're close to being issued. And of the ones that are issued of that batch, the average um, turnaround time was 12 days. Next slide, please. Based on the experience of other communities that have been through this and the experience of Four Leaf having helped many of those communities, there's a three year arc or time frame to a community's recovery. And typically, most of the building permits are issued in the second year and in the third year. Uh, Four Leaf has assured us that we are in the place you would expect us to be at this point in time relative to that arc or cycle. We are neither ahead of where we should be nor behind. So we're in a typical spot relative to how a recovery unfolds. Um, two of the principles of the Recovery Permit Center, Marcus Johnson and Mike Renner, are, um, are available for questions later should your board have any. Next slide, please. Uh, importantly, the RPC is a model that is informing the PRIMO efforts of the department and really of all of the departments that have a part of the permit process. Um, as you know, PRIMO is the countywide continuous improvement process. Um, in the planning department, PRIMO efforts did not stop uh, during the time of COVID and the fire emergency. What did happen is we had to pivot and the projects that we thought would be the focus of our PRIMO efforts um, were not. We shifted to the ones that helped us do our uh, shift to remote services. An example would be discretionary permits. We had um, making that process and that intake process electronic and paperless somewhere in the middle of the list of all of the Primo projects that we hope to accomplish. And after COVID, you know, obviously that went right to the top. And so we accomplished that out of order, but nevertheless, Primo has been going apace. This is a um, preview of some of the practices that we think are most likely to be the ones that are priorities for implementing um, a, a more streamlined process in the Unified Permit Center. So. Um, to talk about the UPC as a project, it's a good time for me to introduce Carolyn Burke. You know Carolyn as our senior civil engineer, but Carolyn has a um, time-bound special assignment right now, and that assignment is to manage the creation and the standing up of a unified permit center that would involve public works, environmental health, ourselves, other associated agencies that have a hand in the process, such as the fire districts. So let me give Carolyn the space for a couple of slides to explain her work. Thank you, Paya, for the introduction and for the opportunity to share more about this exciting venture. The Unified Permit Center consists of both the physical and organizational integration of county land use divisions to both align 
permit requirements and provide the public with a single location to obtain permit services and information from all county reviewing agencies. As a customer focused entity, creation of the UPC requires contributions of partners both within and outside the county organization. A physical remodel of the current planning department, zoning and building counter will co-locate staff from the permitting divisions of the planning, public works and environmental health departments to create a full service permit, uh, public permit counter. Concurrently, staff from these divisions will be working to develop and improve permit review processes, web offerings and service models to better meet the needs of our customers. All staffing and process improvement plans will be developed in consultation with county fire and local fire agencies who also play an important role in the permit review process. While physical and organizational structures provide the framework for the UPC, we recognize that the participation and cooperation of the professional land use community and owner builders is imperative to realizing the benefits of any steps taken to streamline the permitting process. We look forward to engaging with the community in the coming months to gather suggestions and constructive feedback on improvements to the system. Next slide, please. During the next six months, our efforts will be focused on establishing the UPC infrastructure, including organization and staffing, service models, baseline metrics, and identification of the highest priority process improvements. The UPC core team has already begun meeting with a private architecture firm under contract to prepare plans for the physical counter remodel and anticipate that we will begin providing service in early 2022. That concludes my presentation and I'll pass it back to Paya. Thanks, Carolyn. You're welcome. Um, so um, thank you to the board for hearing from us this morning. I do want to take a moment to thank the planning department staff, each and every one and their families for their dedication and their teamwork. Um, that teamwork was in evidence both within the department, but also very much um, working with the other departments as we all work to respond to the challenges that we had in the last year. Um, uh, quite a bit of what we do is in the background. And so I do welcome the opportunity to, um, to, to thank everybody for all of that work. Our recommended actions are to approve the proposed budget for the planning department as recommended by the CAO. And uh, these are the reference pages where you find the detail about our budget, the schedule, and continuing agreements. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, it's very impressive. It's been a very busy year for the planning department and related departments. Um, I, I really want to thank the planning department for setting up the uh, recovery permit center to help the fire victims in particular. Looking back, that work is being expedited in a way that would not have been possible really without bringing uh, in outside help. Um, and many, many of the lessons we're learning uh, with Four Leaf uh, will help the county's regular permitting process over the long haul. Um, I also want to thank the uh, planning for working with the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Uh, many of the most challenging recovery and rebuilding issues require really a close coordination with uh, various offices and it's very much appreciated. I also think the general public, and I've mentioned this before, should know uh, that we um, and this recovery effort are so dependent on what some of the rules and regulations are with the state in particular and somewhat with the federal government as well. But uh, the Department of Forestry, which I think is going to be issuing its report on how it's going to be today on its recovery center. Uh, I can tell you that about a month ago, Kyle Levine and David Reed of our recovery center uh, chief analysts uh, spoke before the Department of Forestry, which was re ready to put down some basic criteria of how you can rebuild, uh, in particular septics, but really in particular on road access. And the presentation that Paya uh, Levine and David Reed uh, presented really just set them back and said, wow, one size doesn't fit all in these recoveries. Uh, if it's a fire in Fresno, it's different terrain and ge geology. Uh, from what it is in Santa Cruz County in the mountains. Uh, so uh, they, um, I, I am very hopeful they're gonna come up with a reasonable um, recommendation on how we can uh, have access to those uh, facilities of those houses that were burned to the ground. And uh, they won't have to build uh, 20 foot wide roads, but they can 
make adjustments in working with the fire departments and so forth. Uh, very, very important. I think the general public should know how important it was that Santa Cruz County had very, very significant input in uh, just letting the Department of State Department of Forestry just hold back in its rules and regulations that are upcoming. Um, and then looking forward, I'm really in, in, really in excited about uh, the new ADU and the tiny home ordinances that are coming are going to be coming before us and the sustainability plan that, as was mentioned, uh, was really brought up in 2014. We're really getting to it now. And I think something of uh, significance is going to be uh, done this year in 2021-22 in that regard. Um, I think uh, the uh, also, uh, as Carolyn Burke mentioned, the the uh, the oversight, the establishment of the Unified Permit Center is going to be a real significant addition and well accepted by the general public, uh, so they can get through the permitting process more quickly uh, and, in essence, in a one-stop shop. That's going to be really significant in our future. Um, the housing division. Um, to maintain our Measure J housing stock and work with the board offices and community members on creative approaches to building more affordable housing. And with the examples which you have you showed us right now, it's really paying off now. And lastly, I just want to congratulate uh, Planning Director Kathy Malloy on her impending retirement and appreciate all of the effort the Assistant Director Pyle Levine has had and uh, the entire planning team for adjusting and addressing a crisis that was at hand after the pandemic and fires, and now really getting ready to move ahead with some very significant planning uh, policies that we have and, and we're going to see come into play in this next fiscal year. Uh, are there any other, uh, Mr. Koenig, some comment, comments? Sure, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you everyone in the planning department for excellent presentations. Um, I think, that you, the uh, amazing work you've done transitioning to online permits uh, in the last year is really one of the uh, un, unsung successes uh, of of how our county has, has weathered the pandemic and um, the CZU fire. Um, I mean, just the the numbers are are very impressive, um, going from you know zero uh, online permits a couple of years ago to five hundred, and then uh, over one thousand in the last year, uh, as well as um, really almost tripling the number of electronic building permit services um, from about 694 to 18, 1,887. Um, that's a, it's a really big change in the way the department does work and um, it's, it's very impressive. So congratulations. Of course, all, you also did a lot of great work with the temporary use ordinance. Um, you know, those 39 permits you issued for people to be able to uh, use the outdoor space for dining uh, or uh, outdoor gyms. And it really made a big difference to a lot of businesses. And so that was fantastic. I hope we were able to roll out that program. Um, and then of course, all of the big projects that you're working on, um, you know, see, seeing the uh, breaking ground on 1500 Capitola Road, um, our recent review of the Dominican expansion. Um, it's exciting to hear that the Habitat for Humanity project on Harper is, uh, we have two of those homes that will be closing escrow in the next two weeks. Um, and of course, coming up with the Kaiser Building uh, on SoCal Avenue, uh, East Cliff Village redevelopment, and the Seventh and Bromer site. Overall, I I think that the investment that we're making in planning this year, the the 14% increase in the budget overall, is really smart. Um, ultimately, um, you know, planning is what's going to drive uh, the majority of future revenues for our county because our county is. Uh, one of the primary revenue sources, property taxes. And so the more we enable our community to grow through a good functional planning department, um, ultimately the, uh, the more revenues the county will have to work with in the future and uh, to, to be able to invest in things like parks and roads. Um, so it's great that we're getting two new building techs uh, to be able to speed up the, the process uh, with which we can uh, process applications. And I'm really excited to see all the work um, that Ms. Burke is doing on the Unified Permit Center with the customer focus and, and collaborative effort between departments. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, you know, I noticed we, so we're seeing a pretty significant increase um, in permit fees, uh, largely from the recovery permit center, about 43% increase. Um, and, uh, you know, that's obviously uh, kind of good and bad. Um, you know, because it just represents the huge size uh, or, or a huge amount of work necessary to rebuild all these homes. 
Um, I'm curious first if that 43% increase in revenues correspond, uh, corresponds to like a 43% increase in, in permit applications that we'll be processing. Are you um, are you thinking specifically about the recovery permit center or the planning department as a whole? I think that um, a lot of it is comes from the permit uh, recovery center. It's in the licenses and permits. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for pointing that. Where what you're thinking about um, the recovery permit center will be um, the recipient, if you will, of of uh, incoming revenue. And that will ultimately be a high number because of the number of permits we expect to come through. On the other hand, that's offset by the um, uh, out the expense of creating the center and keeping it running. And what we have um, uh, estimated is that over the course of the contract, the three-year contract, those two things are about going to balance out. So um, we're making an initial investment um, in the early year before the permits are coming in. And that's partly to fund our advanced work with all of the individuals and do the pre-application work. And then when the permits start to come in, then that um, investment will be repaid. So we expect that to be kind of a net zero at the end of the day. Yeah, I think the, the way the four life contract structure is structured is great and that it, it basically um, scales very, very well because the the um, revenues fund the costs. I was, the question was, if that 43% increase is corresponds to, you know, roughly a 43% increase in the number of permits that we're processing um, you know, with the recovery permit center uh, and through the planning department. Well, we, um, we um, estimated that the uh, permit fees, license and permit fees coming into the regular side of the, of the department would be about flat. Um, similar to last year. So the increase that you see to the extent it's about permits coming in, it's about fire related permits coming in. Okay. Is that answering your question? Uh, sort of, yeah. So I mean, basically that 43% that increase represents all of the additional um, permit applications for, for rebuilding. Mostly, yes. Okay. Um, if someone doesn't have sufficient, you know, if they didn't have sufficient insurance or are experiencing hardships in other ways, is there a way for folks to apply for some kind of reduction in fees uh, to rebuild? Um, I'd say that's being attacked on two fronts. One is the board has previously um, uh, waived certain fees. We've designed a process where certain um, reviews don't need to happen. So those typical fees are not charged and some fees have been decreased, um, you know, basically halved and review fees for technical reports and that whole system have also um, um, don't approach what it costs to do that work. So the board's already taken those actions vis-a-vis -vis the fees. And then really spearheaded by the um, OR3 and the long-term recovery group, there's kind of an umbrella of programs that are being developed for fire survivors. And um, um, I don't know if direct fee relief is on the menu, but um, they're the group who are looking at what do they, what do fire survivors need most in terms of support. And um, if this is one of those things, then I'm sure that they've got it on the menu of what they're trying to, you know, a, a need they're trying to meet. Great. Well, some avenues available. Um, also, a related question. Um, I know the charge for services, I think, is expected to um, go down about $450,000. And, and that will, um, I, I believe, in the comments because uh, anticipating only a 50% restoration of the furlough. Um, with 100% restoration of the furlough um, and you know, being more fully staffed, would we expect that um, charges for services would you know, remain, remain the same or even go up? The charges for services, I believe, are the revenues that come from our what we call our at-cost projects, um, where the planner's time is being charged on an hourly basis. So that one, um, we do that for um, development review work and also for certain technical reviews. So that should reflect the demand for those services. Um, yeah, if that answers your question. Okay, and, and with more uh, with more staff, will we be able to you know, fulfill a greater amount of demand, or do you think that the demand is a little bit lower this year? 
Well, that's, you know, that, that's a good observation. Um, we, it, it, we're always looking at the, the planner's time because time that they're spending on other things or time that we could be billing that we aren't billing because we don't have the planners to be doing that work is, is always in our minds. And so um, that is really a balance. And um, it is mostly the development review staff that um, um, account for that kind of hourly revenue. And there is, there is, as you know, there's always a, you know, there's always a, um, a queue, you know, in development review, and um, more time could always be spent. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, and again, just um, excited about the the increased investment, um, particularly in the sustainability and special projects as well. The forty two seven point two percent increase. Uh, you know, I really think it's going to pay dividends for our county um, and look forward to all the great work that uh, is coming out of the planning department. Thank you, Mike. Uh, comments from other board members? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'll just jump in here. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kathy uh, for her excellent problem solving skills and commitment to public service. Um, she'll be missed, and I want to thank her entire staff who really stepped up uh, in this time of crisis to provide um, really needed resources to the community, as well as the sort of ongoing uh, continual uh, permit applications that we see. Um, I thought the, the department has done an excellent job, and it's on a good trend um, going forward. I, I uh, When you talk about that, that arc of recovery, um, in my anecdotal conversations, I know Supervisor McPherson goes to these community meetings as well. Um, I believe that actually we would be ahead of on the arc were it not for the incredibly high cost of building materials and labor right now. Um, people um, have found the process very easy. Um, it's a difficult time. It's difficult for people to, to go through the process of, in regular times, uh, but certainly after they've experienced the trauma of a fire, um, it's, it's, ex it's very difficult. And I think our staff and the four lead staff have been excellent about doing outreach and, and being there for them when they need the most. Um, and I, like everyone, like others have said, uh, I appreciate that we're learning lessons uh, from this crisis that then we can apply to our regular permitting process um, and the move towards more electronic uh, conversations and a simplified permitting process, I think will um, will pay dividends both for the county and the community going forward. But I just wanna thank um, everyone who's who stepped up and really served this community when they needed it the most. Thank you, thank you. Um, Supervisor Friend, any comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also would like to uh, thank and commend uh, Ms. Malloy for her work as the director for the last, uh, well, the entire time I've been on the board of supervisors. And so I haven't known a, uh, another director. And, and I felt that um, you were an integral part of my understanding of the land use patterns within Santa Cruz County. You were always available to sit down with me and explain complex issues, especially when I was a new supervisor. And, and we've had plenty of phone calls and conversations both late in the evening and on weekends. And so your availability, uh, especially in advance of board meetings was always appreciated. And um, there's a lot of work that's done behind the scenes to make sure that that the board and, and staff really do understand the complexity of, of what makes up California land use law, which is really something else, uh, very unique to hear, I'll say. And uh, your work in helping modernize the planning department over the last nine or so years is not unnoticed. Um, your team that you've also put together, your executive team with Hiya, Carolyn, and others. They're an excellent team, and I'm looking forward to seeing the next phase of the planning department as we modernize even more. It's uh, Some of this, as Supervisor Coonerty has noted, uh, had to come due to crisis, but some of it were things that were actually already in, in the planning process, and this may be expediting it. It's a team that is interested in innovation, and, and uh, we as a board, I know, are interested in innovation. There's a lot of pressures within Santa Cruz County to ensure that we can provide additional housing, especially affordable housing, but we can also do it within the values and the environmental requirements uh, that CEQA outlines. And I think that that's a very difficult task to do, but I think it's a task that your team does very well. And um, and I'm excited about uh, some of the changes that are actually coming the next year or two um, that, that your team is helping to drive in this regard. But but Kathy, just an acknowledgement uh, for your work because um, you will you will be missed, not only will you be missed, but I, I, I think that a lot of my understanding at least 
uh, on the planning side came from some of those early conversations where you really took a lot of time to ensure that each of the board members understood the nuances of what we needed to know. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Caput, uh, Supervisor Caput, any comments? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank your staff also for all the hard work uh, you've been uh, doing. I only have one question, and uh, basically that would be uh, uh, for the affordable housing with MedPen uh, 78 Atkinson Lane. Uh, it's a project that I want to be uh, behind and actually work to get it done. Uh, the problem of what I'm trying to avoid is uh, years ago when I was on the city council, uh, when you open up one like uh, Brewington or Rogers that'll connect to uh, uh, Atkinson Lane, uh, the people in that whole community of Martinelli and uh, Stanford and all these different streets down there, they're worried that it's gonna become a thoroughfare that'll be like Freedom Boulevard shooting through and it'll be a shortcut uh, going through Atkinson Lane. Uh, I think we need to be very open on that. Uh, we have to have public comment on it and what kind of traffic mitigation we have for that project of uh, adding affordable housing. Uh, I guess what I'm basically saying, I don't need a big battle going on now uh, after we've been working with COVID and uh, uh, also, uh, you know, the fire situation, the homeless shelters and all that. So I think this can be done right, but we have to show the public uh, what traffic mitigation we have that will prevent that from being a thoroughfare where people will take a shortcut and change the whole community. I, the Martinelli area and all that is about a mile and a half away. And right now it dead ends and then it would be opened up. So uh, we got to look at that real close. Have you got a, uh, you know, schematic and everything we can uh, uh, work that out? I don't know if that's a question there. Yeah, yeah, Supervisor Caput, we will be sure and work with you and the community on that project as it moves forward. And um, and so you can be assured we're gonna be very much in touch with you and working with you in the community to to finalize the plans for that project. You remember how heated it got when uh, we were both uh, working with the city at the time, yeah. Oh yeah, I remember. So, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty bad. Yeah, I still have the scars for that, yeah. <laughs> okay, but I think it could be worked out, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, any questions from the public? Any comments from the public? There are no members from the public that would like to address this item. Okay. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the uh, planning department budget. I'll move the recommended action. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you again. Planning Department. Uh, now we will consider approval of the 2021-22 proposed budgets for the Department of Public Works, including any, any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. We have the 2021-22 proposed budget, pages 259 to 288. Uh, supplemental budget, pages 74. Uh, 71 to 74 on the ARPA and staffing changes, and a supplemental budget, budget uh, pages 75 and 76 uh, on infrastructure requests. Matt Machado, our uh, Assistant uh, County Administrative Officer and Director of Public Works will be making the presentation. Thank you, Chair. I will share my screen here momentarily. Uh, let's see. Can you see our, can you see my screen? Yes, we can hear you. Fine. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Chair McPherson, Supervisors, CAO Palacio, Mr. Palacios. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. I'm one of the deputy CAOs and the director of public works. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our CAO and his budget team for their leadership, guidance, and support. I would like to also thank our Public Works leadership and budget team for managing hundreds of programs and efforts. 
Today, uh, oops, get over here. Today, I will cover uh, achievements, our budget proposal numbers, and emerging issues. I would like to begin with some of our achievements, which were also documented in the county strategic plan objectives. We had a record year in many ways. We began repair on 34 storm damage repair projects. We resurfaced more than 32 miles of roadway. We repaired or replaced nearly 27,000 feet of sewer pipe. We completed significant roadway, roadway repairs on 15 county roads, and we mowed more than 300 lane miles of shoulder vegetation. We also secured significant grant funds to improve Soquel Drive. Additionally, we achieved multiple major milestones in the effort to deliver the Pajaro River flood control projects, and we responded and adapted to two major disasters in our county. Public Works logged nearly 12,000 hours in direct response to the CZU fire. I'm very proud of our Public Works team and very grateful for their commitment, perseverance, and dedication to serving our community. Moving into our proposed budget, our proposed budget as compared to our current year budget is before you. The primary reason for the significant change in the budget number is due to storm damage project delivery schedules. You heard this in the opening remarks this morning uh, from Ms. Mowry. But I'll add a bit more to that. During this current fiscal year, Public Works repaired 34 sites, including the restoration of access to roads that had been closed since the 2017 storm damage. Uh, at this point, all the roadways damaged during the 2017 event are open to traffic. In this coming year, we plan to deliver a significant number of projects that will restore two lanes of travel on those roadways that had lost partial lanes. After this coming fiscal year, we will continue to make final repairs to damaged shoulders and damaged storm drain facilities from the 2017 event. We believe that in the next two to three years, we will essentially complete all of the repair of the monumental damage from the 2017 storm season. And we expect our overall budget to fluctuate during this time significantly due to the storm damage project delivery schedule. Lastly, I would like to point out the near status quo of staffing level shown on this slide at a proposed level of 265.75 full-time equivalents. Here is our proposed budget by major division. In the transportation division, we have 78 full-time equivalents, which include 57 field staff and 21 engineering and support staff. The proposed budget of a little more than 58 million includes 23 million for general roadway projects, 24 million for 2017 storm damage repair projects, and approximately 10 million for road operations and maintenance. In the special services division, we have 131 full-time equivalents, which include 63 sanitation staff, eight drainage and flood control staff, 53 recycling and solid waste staff, and seven construction management staff members. The proposed budget of more than 37 million includes 21 million for recycling and solid waste, 12 million for drainage and flood control, and 4 million for sanitation, noting that this number excludes the large sanitation district, which has its own separate budget process. And then finally, our administration division, which is our centralized business office providing support to all functions of public works. This division also includes our fleet budget and our CSA program administration budget. Before sharing some emerging issues, I'm going to shift into some highlights of our capital projects and real property division. This division continues to focus on support of RTC infrastructure efforts, including 
various segments of the MBSST rail trail project, various elements of Highway 1 projects and pedestrian overcrossings. They also will continue to support and project manage various facility site plans, and they are providing critical design and project management for our recycling and solid waste division. Moving now into emerging issues, I will begin in our transportation division. Uh, this group continues to focus, uh, emerging issues continue to focus around funding, deferred maintenance, and the pursuit of grant funding. I would like to point out that we continue to work with state and federal leaders to develop the future of roadway maintenance funding beyond the practical structure of the current gas tax program. We are also working closely with our regional partners at the RTC to ensure regional funding is prioritized and used to its fullest extent. Lastly, we seem to be in a constant natural disaster response and recovery mode which is the nature of our natural environment here in Santa Cruz County. Next, I would like to share some of the emerging issues in our special services division. Uh, they include uh, continual focus and more detail on the needs of a new transfer station at Buena Vista landfill and a new organics processing facility also proposed at the Buena Vista landfill. We will continue to provide updates on financial strategies and project options and analysis in this coming year. Other continued efforts and challenges include sewer, water, and drainage infrastructure needs. Lastly, we have accomplished multiple milestones with our Pajaro River flood control project and will continue to focus energy and resources to deliver this much needed project to our community in the, south, the southern part of our county. This leads me to the recommended action of consideration of approval of the 2021-22 proposed budget for the Department of Public Works, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Uh, I can address any questions you may have, noting that we also have key staff on the call today to help answer any questions. And I would like to thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Mr. Machado, and thank you, my colleagues on the board, for uh, allowing me, because I'm the chair, just to make some uh, early statements on each of these subject matters. Uh, it's really hard to imagine a county department that has more breadth uh, in its operations than public works. When you consider road maintenance, recycling, and solid waste, sanitation, real property, and on and on. Uh, but one of the biggest topics of members of the public uh, contact the, the board about is road condition and it's understandable that with 600 miles of roadway in the county it takes a considerable amount of time and funding to address the needs the best we can. As identified in this budget report, um, we face $300 million in deferred maintenance and $260 million in, uh, that's in roads. Uh, and. Um, and then we also have culverts and other uh, issues that we have to face in transportation. Um, and I really, again, want to express my appreciation for voters approving Measure D in 2016 uh, here for the county and then the state legislature for approving the SV1 and the voters sustaining that, uh, that road uh, financing uh, bill that we the state passed. And I, I'm hopeful that the infrastructure bill I worked on now in the federal level with the Biden administration. I just I hope and pray that infrastructure indeed gets uh, is really gets the bulk of that. And uh, I know there's quite a discussion back in Washington, D.C. Um, and I just want to thank Public Works for stretching its resources as best it can and making it work as, as well as you have. Uh, it's been really outstanding. Uh, specifically, I'd, I'd like to compliment and thank the road crews for greatly increasing the number of vegetation management miles to 300 miles. In my eight years in office, that's the most we have been able to accomplish, I think, overall. And it's sorely needed during this extreme drought and fire season that we have. Um, I also want to thank Public Works for uh, the close working relationship that's had with our library system, 
uh, specifically on its management of the six construction projects that have resulted in the beautiful new branches and important renovation projects that we've mentioned earlier, uh, whether it be up in the San Lorenzo Valley or at Capitola, well, that's in the city, but La Selva and other places. Um, and I'd like to um, really, I don't know how you can express this, the appreciation I have for the response that you had uh, for the C uh, after the CZU fire. It was a gigantic effort uh, to remove down trees and get roads open. In particular, I want to acknowledge uh, you, Mr. Machado, and your team and other aspects uh, and other aspects of the fire recovery plan. It's truly a joint effort with many fire departments. Um, there's one issue that I think in the years to come, we all want to see um, the um, greenhouse gas emissions reduced, which automobiles or, or traffic is responsible for about half of them. But uh, we, with I mentioned Measure D and SB1, and now we've been able to do more, uh, we address more road problems than we ever have. But with the addition of and concentration on bike lanes and pedestrian access, which we all want, and uh, electric vehicles, I can see that the revenues coming from the gas tax are going to be decreasing in the very near future quite a bit that are applied to road maintenance. Um, I haven't heard of any specific big uh, legislation, state or federal, that addresses that issue about how we can keep up with the revenue sources that might be coming in for road maintenance and the uh, for uh, for the uh, access to uh, transportation from pedestrians and bikes. Have you heard of anything yourself that's really in the hopper? And the, the sessions are just about ready to end, but. Um, this is going to be a real problem for financing um, our public works projects regarding roads in the future. I think. Yeah, it's it's a hot topic. Uh, I, I haven't heard of any solutions yet, but I'm I'm happy to say that they're talking about it, and that's the start of a solution, right? Is discussing right. it. So we will keep engaging and and uh, push for solutions. But you're right on. It's um, the gas tax is uh, it, it may be at the end of its uh, useful life, and so we need to look for a new way to fund all the modes of transportation, uh, something that uh, can uh, can meet the needs, needs of our community. So you're, you're, you're right on there, Supervisor. Thank you. I think with the board members' comments first, I'd uh, start at the other end with Supervisor Caput. Um, do you have any uh, questions or remarks for Mr. Machado? Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Well, thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, you've got a, uh, being the head of public works and all that, uh, you're involved in all kinds of issues. And uh, uh, I wanna thank you for all the time and attention you've been putting into it. So uh, I know you're looking out for South County and uh, we got Lakeview uh, uh, paved and it looks good. And of course, uh, about a year or two ago, we got uh, Highway 1, um, hmm. The, the numbers anyway, Riverside Drive, <laughs> connecting all the way to 101. Uh, locals call it by the name uh, Riverside or Hecker Pass or uh, what do you call it? Uh, anyway, rather than the numbers. So, and also the work that's been done on Highway 152 and Green Valley. And uh, supervisor friend and I share uh, Green Valley Road and uh, uh, things have been going real well. Uh, thank you. And we'll we'll concentrate later on on uh, Murphy uh, Crossing, and we'll have more discussion on that. So thank you. Thank you. Is that uh, read your comments, Mr. Supervisor Caput? Uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty? Sorry, I just want to Take a moment. Uh, just want to thank you uh, for your work, your quick response um, to the fires. You were all out there um, as the as the hillsides were still burning, um, making making repairs. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the investment that we're making in our essential infrastructure. I know, um, as as has been raised, where there there aren't adequate resources right now. Um, but I think we're making some targeted investments that will pay benefits uh, for all the county residents. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really briefly, I mean, because I work so so closely with um, Public Works. I mean, you guys are really our rock stars with very limited resources. On, and it isn't just about the roads and it isn't just about the fires, but about the flood protection and everything else that you do. I just want to know that uh, you to know with the, uh, the recent storm damage we even had in my district this last winter, even though it seemed like we didn't have any rains, we had a pretty significant project. And then the work that we're still building out of Really just appreciate that attitude that you guys bring to the job every single day and uh, look forward to working with you in the coming year. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Machado, for all your amazing work this last year, both in the, uh, of course, and your entire department, uh, both in the response to the CZU fire uh, and in making up so much ground on this the storm damage repair. Um, it, it's pretty remarkable the, res the breadth of responsibilities that DPW has uh, from roads and drainage to sanitation district and recycling and solid waste capital projects. Um, so it, it's, it's amazing how much you, you guys manage. I, I just want to reiterate uh, what Supervisor McPherson said that uh, road conditions are probably the thing we hear from uh, constituents about the most. And it, it's really no surprise. I think roads are the one county service uh, that, that every resident in the county uses every day. Even if you're not leaving your home, uh, it's quite likely that you're, you're getting an Amazon uh, package delivery or, uh, or somebody else is using roads to, to ensure that uh, your, your electric lines or um, you know, other services, utilities are, are reaching you successfully. So it's pr probably our most essential county infrastructure. And the fact that we have $300 million in deferred maintenance uh, and, and that that's a hole that's getting deeper by the, to the tune of $24 million every year, uh, I think is really a, a rallying cry uh, for this board uh, and uh, for our entire county that we, we have to address this issue um, because we, we can't afford to let our roads continue to deteriorate year after year. Um, so whether it's growing uh, existing tax base, looking at new revenue measures or just fighting like hell to make sure we get our fair share uh, from the RTC for of regional funding, we, we absolutely have to address this issue. And you know, just to, to finish on a high note, um, it's been really exciting watching the pop-up on Portola go in. And I think um, you know, it, it just reminds us that the work that happens with public works, I mean, it's, it's our built environment and it has such an opportunity to change the way we think about our community, to inspire us and really to, to, to change the way that we move around, which of course is integrally linked uh, to our emissions and to, um, and to how we address the climate crisis. So I think there's a ton of opportunity here if we do this right um, to, to inspire everyone uh, who, who lives here, but we have to address the ongoing, uh, the ongoing deficit. Thank you, thank you. And I think probably um, as enlightening as anything is that Buena Vista landfill, that landfill that will never die, has another eight or 10 years left in it. But, uh, it, but also to correct that, it's, what is it, a $30 million project at least yeah, to move it's a big one. Yeah, that's one of the, the capital projects we're going to have to really face up to very near future, really, eight years. Okay, um, any other closing comments, Mr. Machado? Uh, are, listen, are there any comments from the public? There are no members that would like to speak to this item. Yeah, I just want to mention, too, that uh, um, Director uh, Machado um, mention about the water infrastructure and public works really works on that, but the county itself is not the water purveyor. There's several water districts, as people know. Um, that is uh, the, what you can do to improve that situation. I know that with the, a lot of building comparatively that is going on, people are concerned about running out of water or coming into a drought season. Our, our function is really to uh, connect those resources from the various districts is for the county. Uh, I think people need to have a little more clarity on that. Um, I don't know if you want to make any comments on that, but uh, thank you for your efforts in uh, helping that big concern in the county. Yeah, I think there, you know, there's some great projects going on in those utilities such as water. And uh, even though we don't manage much of it, uh, we do coordinate with all of it, uh, with the road use, with that connectivity, with the support 
of uh, some of the very large projects, you know, some of the some of the recharge projects, some of the recycling projects. And so uh, even though we don't manage it directly, we get to be a part of it in, in a partnership fashion. And uh, it's critical, as you say, uh, especially in this uh, drought time and trying to make those make the best use of those resources that we have. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, right, well, Mr. Chair, I'll move the yeah. recommended actions. Second. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go to our last item on the regular agenda 34 before we go into closed session. Uh, and that's to consider approval of the 2021-22 proposed budgets for the plan acquisition acquisition uh, section of uh, capital projects, including any supplement supplemental materials, and take related actions uh, as outlined in the reference budget documents and recommended by the county administrative officer. We have the 2021-22 proposed budget on pages six, uh, excuse me, 369 to 384 and a supplemental budget of pages 95 uh, to 100. And I think to uh, address us in this, um, let's see here, I think Trish Daniels, is she going to be the senior analyst? Or, or Carlos, are you going to be talking about that initially? I just wanted to introduce uh, Trish Daniels from the County Administrative Officer's Office, and she's going to be uh, leading, starting off with our presentation. Thank you. Great. Trish, I believe you're on mute. Uh, no, we still can't hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me start over again and try this again. Okay, so my name is Trish Daniels. I am an analyst in the County Administrative Office, and I'm here today to present the plant acquisition section of the Capital Projects Budget. Um, also with me today are Parks Director Jeff Gaffney, General Services Director Michael Beaton, and Director of, Public Wor um, Director of Capital Projects in Public Works, Travis Carey. Um, our agenda today will consist of a general overview of capital projects, along with a review of fiscal year 2021 and a preview of fiscal year 21-22. We will have a couple of slides on the numbers and then project presentations from parks, general services, and public works. So we're gonna start with just a general overview of capital projects. And so capital projects consists of both plant acquisition and infrastructure plan acquisition, including government buildings, facilities, libraries, parks, and beaches, um, while infrastructure projects are mainly streets, sewers, drainage facilities, and other things of that type. The infrastructure projects are part of the uh, public works budget, which we just heard their presentation. And so this budget presentation will focus only on the plant portion of capital projects. Uh, lastly, as a reminder to the board and to the public, plant projects from prior years, from fiscal year 2021 and even prior to that, are fully budgeted and rebudgeted as part of the adopted budget process. Therefore, as we go through the numbers, you will see some significant drops in percentages, but that will change once the adopted budget is finalized. So just a quick uh, 2021 year in review, um, the facilities, a couple of facilities highlights, the long range facility plan was accepted by the board on February 2nd, 2021. The plan contains a number of recommendations, including consolidation of the real property portfolio, supporting housing development and supporting flexible remote work policies amongst a, a number of other recommendations. Um, staff will continue to implement those recommendations from the plan um, with the first step being the acquisition, the potential acquisition, if everything goes as planned, of the West Ridge facility in Watsonville as the location of the new South County Service Center. 
um, also related to facilities, the Capital Projects Review Committee was officially launched in December 2020. And this group consists of representatives from the County Administrative Office, the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector, General Services, and Public Works. Um, the group meets monthly to review and approve uh, capital projects. In fiscal year 21-22, the committee will develop and approve a scoring methodology that will continue to assist us um, as far as prioritizing and financing capital projects. Um, when we get to deferred maintenance, unfortunately, aside from critical emergencies that required an immediate response, little progress was made on deferred maintenance, but that's mainly because general services staff were reassigned to support pandemic shelter and care functions, and that really did take up a lot of their time. But we do expect that to turn around next year as we um, as we go into um, the next fiscal year and we wind down, wind down the shelter operations. Uh, so next we're gonna review the 20, uh, 21-22 proposed budget. And this is where we sort of get into the numbers. So just as a preview, um, we have $3 million um, in facilities and that is from the general fund and it consists of 2.5 million for critical capital projects. Um, and those were approved by the capital projects review committee. And so the two projects that were approved were funding for the unified permit center that you heard um, about from the planning department. And that project was approved for $1.1 million and then additional funding of 1.4 million for the main um, jail control system to address electrical and any other infrastructure needs as that project gets under underway um, in the next few months. Um, the control system was originally funded for $2 million from the CERTS financing and is currently funded for $4.5 million, which we believe to be a sufficient budget to complete the project. Uh, general fund dollars of 500,000 have been set aside to respond to deferred maintenance projects in 2122. Um, this includes responding to immediate needs, including replacing the roof of the facility at Highlands Park. Um, other financing sources includes $500,000 in American Rescue Plan funding, and that's to clean the HVAC ducts at the main jail, and also funding from Cal OES, both their power safety shutoff program and their community power resilience program. Um, and we will be using that funding to also replace and or upgrade the generator at the main jail. Uh, lastly, the 21-22 capital improvement plan will be prepared by the Public Works Department in the fall for presentation to the board uh, no later than November. Preparing the CIP after final budget adoption um, allows for more accurate budget information in the document. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the numbers. Plan acquisition um, is, it consists of general fund plant, fund 40, which is government facilities, funds 42 through 49, which are various parks funding sources and park dedication districts. So this chart shows the total funding for all of the funds combined. The $3 million that you see in the general fund contribution is the same as part of the $3 million that you see on the revenues line. Administratively, the, con the contribution is budgeted in general fund plant and then is transferred to fund 40 plant um, as an operating transfer. So in reality, the total expenditures are really less by $3 million. And it's just because of the way we have to, um, we have to complete those budget actions. Um, and then the next slide will um, provide a breakdown of the expenditures by division. So here again, we have the breakdown of the various divisions in plant. Um, the $3 million, again, the $3 million that you see in plant is the same $3 million that you see on the facilities line. Um, facilities is scheduled to decrease by 95.4%. Um, parks and special projects and the redevelopment successor agency, sorry about that have a total of 77,800 in funding or a 95.5% reduction from fiscal year 2021. And park dedication budgets are reduced by 11% to 1.65 million in 21-22. For a total proposed budget of $7.7 .7 million or an 
0.8% reduction from the prior fiscal year. Although again, just as the last reminder, this number will substantially increase once prior year projects are rebudgeted as part of the adopted budget process. So next we'll have project presentations by Parks, General Services and Public Works. And first up will be Parks Director, Jeff Gaffney. Thank you, Trish, and hello again, uh, board and Chair, uh, Chair McPherson and the rest of the board. I appreciate some time to talk about some of the things we're moving on. Um, I think uh, people are, are aware and the board is aware that we've been fundraising at Hidden Beach. Um, and to some degree, we've had a lot of success. And um, this has also been uh, an effort for a family who lost their son, their very young son, Jet, and um, it is a very special project that we've been able to work on getting the playground completed and making it actually accessible for all. We anticipate that'll be done by the end of this year, um, something that we're looking forward to doing and, and potentially uh, working on maybe even adding a, a regular permanent restroom out there. So that's a nice thing. Uh, we're replacing the roof at Highlands. Um, roof is Roofs in parks are always so significant and so important, and I'm glad we're able to get another roof in place. Uh, it held, you know, it's so important to the structure and integrity of the buildings that we have. Um, we're doing the elevator replacement at Vets Hall in Santa Cruz, which is so very important um, in general for accessibility, and it's had some issues in the past, and hopefully, try to keep from anybody getting stuck in the elevator. Um, and then Simpkins, the swim center, as we alluded to earlier. We're gonna be doing a lot of things out here, the age of the facilities, the infrastructure, the tremendous amount of infrastructure that goes into a facility of that size and um, all of the things underneath the working parts and pieces. We're gonna be redoing the plaster and piping and um, also working on the slide, as we mentioned. Um, so uh, looking forward to getting a lot of that done and redoing LED lights, which will be uh, great for the power bill um, and also great for the length of time that it'll last. Out at Moran Lake, um, we are working on putting together the restoration and public access plan. Um, this is our first step, as I mentioned, uh, important components of our natural resource management efforts. This is the first step towards getting that um, in place for the Moran Lake Park. And um, that will also be uh, a critical step for us to apply for larger grant funding to do um, larger projects that need to be completed out there. Very sensitive resources that we're dealing with um, and a lot of scientific study involved. So um, I will be now turning it over to the Master of Disaster Response. Man, I've been waiting for all day. Mr. Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. <laughs> wow. Wow. I just got to say, wow. Thanks, Director Gaffney, uh, Trish Daniels, uh, board. Uh, I'm Michael Beaton. I'm the Director of General Services. I don't know about that opening right there, but uh, uh, in addition to, uh, I'd like to thank Carlos Palacios, the County Budget Manager, Christina Mowry, uh, the CEO's office, uh, and the Board of Supervisors for the past considerations and focus on improving county facilities and addressing some deferred maintenance throughout the various county buildings. Uh, the capital projects budget uh, for your consideration today in combination with general services budget is a great step forward. Uh, the budget does, uh, does not only reflect the county's priorities for facilities and capital projects, but also adds staffing to support the numerous projects that are currently being managed. Uh, I would like to thank the general services family for their dedication to the upkeep of the county facilities on a 24 seven basis. Since my time as a director, uh, we have been battling keeping up the, with the failing components of our aging infrastructure. Uh, one of the examples I'll show today, uh, and that is hopefully being addressed in this uh, next year's budget, uh, is a drain pipe from 701 Ocean Street, where we have to replace about four or five of these every single year, and we keep deferring the total replacement project. This is a copper pipe, as you can see, it's uh, completely corroded uh, through. Uh, if you can see my screen. Um, and we continue to replace one patch at a time. Uh, included in the budget and identified on the slide on the bottom bullet point is a set aside of about $500,000 to help us address uh, some deferred maintenance items such as the 701 drainage pipe replacement project, uh, lighting control fix at 701 Ocean, and some light asphalt repair work at Emmeline Campus. 
Some of the other great projects within the capital projects budget includes addressing uh, deferred maintenance at the Roundtree Correctional Facility with the replacement of two 125,000 gallon water well storage tanks and piping with drainage issues uh, for stormwater runoff. Uh, the current tanks at the site are beyond the useful life uh, and have begun to leak and we run the risk of a catastrophe if those do fail and the pump system does not work anymore. Uh, this project is expected to be completed by the year end. The capital projects budget also includes emergency fuel tank replacements at two county fire stations uh, that have failed and our hope is to get them uh, replaced before we have any significant fire uh, as it takes some time for our fire engines and fire apparatus to drive down the hills uh, to get fuel and fueling stations. So this is a, a time essence uh, issue. Uh, you've heard about the DNA lab uh, as well as uh, on the Ch Sheriff Chanticleer uh, uh, campus as well. Next slide, please. One of the significant deferred maintenance items that I'm actually excited about is the 701 waterproofing project that your board will consider for approval uh, of the service agreement next week on June 29th with work to be completed before year end. Every year for the past several years, uh, General Services has strategically placed 40 to 60 buckets, just like the one I'm holding right here throughout 701, uh, because water comes through the cracks of the buildings and the seams of the building. So we have to strategically place buckets every single year to catch the water from entering in the building. This project that uh, the board will hopefully approve next week uh, will address those leaks and uh, the deferred maintenance for the county building. Uh, Included are operational improvements, such as the first phase of the construction of the Unified Permit Center that you heard planning talk about earlier today, uh, with estimated completion in early 2022. Uh, the main jail control systems uh, that Trish Daniels so eloquently identified, um, spearheaded by the Sheriff's Department. The main jail replacement project, uh, which, is, which is expected to be completed by January of 2022. And we are currently having plans and specs being developed and hope to bring that to your board uh, sometime in August for approval to move forward on that project. The main jail HVAC ducting, uh, Trish Daniels identified, which is uh, to clean the airflow and ventilation uh, for requirements of the inmate uh, population and safeguarding. Uh, and the last bullet point that we have identified here is the countywide generator study. Uh, the county has quite a few different buildings where we have generators that are undersized uh, for the building. One example is the 701 Ocean Street. Uh, what this seed money does for us is it allows us to look at each individual county building, the current generation power that we have as far as the backup, and uh, will give us plans and specs uh, for potential consideration in future funding that might become available uh, for us to actually power our critical infrastructure that the county has. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of the joint projects that the County of uh, Santa Cruz has in partnership with General Services and Public Works. Uh, I'll talk about the first one, which is the Sobering Center Replacement Project, and then I'll toss it over to our uh, Director of Capital Projects with the Public Works Department, Travis Carey. The General Services, um, uh, the Sobering Center is a project that uh, we're looking at building on the main campus of the jail. Uh, that involves potential donation of a modular unit or two uh, from the Housing Matters nonprofit uh, and we're currently in design phase and we hope to bring a feasibility study and review uh, that we've been doing in partnership with DPW. Uh, we hope to bring that to the board, I believe in the next few months uh, for consideration. Uh, with that, I'll toss it over to Travis Carey uh, for a continuation of the slide. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Beaton and good morning chair and members of the board and CEO Palacios. Uh, my name is Travis Carey, Director of Capital Projects, Department of Public Works. Uh, and I want to give a special thank you uh, today to Trish Daniels for really leading our uh, the development of the Capital Projects Review Committee um, and organizing all the departments that have been involved in that process. It's been a lot of work and um, we really appreciate uh, your, your uh, leadership in that area. It's, it's been great to bring the departments together and start working together more. Um, so includes, in, in terms of the South County uh, Service Center, it's a big project that, that you're all aware of now. Um, and, and it's a great project uh, that, that demonstrates uh, Public Works and GSD working together. So um, Public Works Real Property and Capital Projects are taking the lead on the, on the acquisition phase. And then we're working very closely now with GSD 
who's assisting us with the facility assessments and the inspections that are required for the facility. And then we'll be working together with GSD to really prioritize the improvements that need to happen at the facility. And all of that gearing up for, uh, you know, really making sure the facility is in good shape to hand over to GSD for the long-term operations and maintenance of the facility. So uh, it's it's been really great on uh, this project and a couple others uh, just starting to work closely together. And um, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. Next slide. All right, so um, this slide here, it gives an example of some of the larger projects that, that we're working on um, out of Public Works. And it really demonstrates a, a pretty robust work plan and another really busy year for us uh, in capital projects. Um, and it, I think it also highlights you know, the benefits of having dedicated project managers at the county and uh, capital projects now fully staffed with our three uh, full-time project managers and I want to give a real uh, quick thank you to the capital projects and real property team so our project managers Damon Adlow Nicole Steele and Rob Tidmore working on all these projects and our real property team uh, led by Kimberly Finley our chief real property agent and our real property agents Doug Dubois and Jerry Vargas so great team a lot of work going on um, and, and great job everybody thank you so much so Juvenile Hall, uh, the first two projects here, um, they've been combined uh, into, into one project that we're, uh, we're ready to go out to bid. We're just waiting for state review. Um, and these, these two projects combined together are being managed by Nicole Steele, the project manager. Um, so again, we're, we're all ready to go. We're waiting for state approval and uh, uh, final development of, of the ground lease. The project is funded and we're and we're ready to go. So we're really looking forward to, to starting construction of at this really critical facility. Uh, the animal shelter project, you'll see that coming to the board for approval to bid on uh, June 29th. And this is the phase one project, which is a $1.8 million uh, renovation of the main facility. And that's being uh, project managed by our project manager, Rob Tidmore in Public Works. And we'll be looking forward to this project going out to bid and then continuing to develop for phase two and phase three uh, out of the Alamo shelter. And a couple of projects on here, the highway, uh, <coughs> highway 152, and also the South County Service Center um, being led by the real property uh, uh, section and capital projects, Kimberly Finley, chief real property agent. Um, so assisting of course roads on, on that project and a couple other uh, smaller projects. Next slide. All right, library. So uh, this is a uh, $37 million construction and renovation program. So we have six active uh, library projects. And these are all being managed by project manager Damon Adlow in Public Works. And Damon has just done a phenomenal job, uh, really single-handedly uh, project managing all six of these projects at one time. They're all in different locations of course in all different phases um, and so we're really excited that we've now completed the Felton and the Selva branches um, are, are now uh, complete. Uh, we have Boulder Creek currently under construction so we'll be looking forward to, to wrapping that one up as well. Live Oak Library is going out uh, to, for construction this fall and then uh, two, two remaining really big projects the Live Oak Annex uh, which is the addition at Simpkins Swim Center and then the Aptos Library, uh, both currently in final design and permitting, and hopefully we'll be getting start on construction in spring 2022. So that kind of outlines some of our, our larger projects, and I think I'm turning it back over to Trish at this point. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. All right, well, that just brings us to the end of our budget presentation. And so now um, the recommended actions are to approve the plan acquisition section of the capital project budget, along with any supplemental materials. I do wanna thank members of the review committee and other county department representatives. As Travis stated, it, it's been a long haul and a lot of work this past year to get this um, committee up and off the ground and running. I, I appreciate both the members' patience and also the department's patience as they navigate this new, um, this new journey into as far as approving capital projects go. Um, so that brings us to the end of our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions that the board or members of the public may have. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Trish and Travis, uh, and for those presentations. Uh, it's really an exciting time uh, for the county to meet, uh, move onward and upward uh, in many, many respects with the libraries and the facilities, the Marine Center, and especially in the South County in the future, it's gonna be a tremendous asset to, to serving people in the South County. Um, I, uh, I just wanna thank you for your dedicated efforts. I think that uh, we're gonna be seeing a lot of good things happening. The county has 300 facilities and uh, we, we will be able to consolidate some of them and better serve the people of the county. So I'm very, very excited about this, uh, the future of our capital projects and thank you for all your dedicated efforts to see us, see us move forward. I think I'll start uh, this time with Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, surprise him. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, the, the wake up calls. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I wanna uh, appreciate the fact that um, I think we have not, um, as, a, as an institution, looked at our uh, real estate and our facilities um, as an essential resource um, that we need to maintain. We looked at them as, like, as, as just ongoing costs and the, the multi-departmental team here uh, who's worked so well together, uh, I think is is really um, treating our facilities the way they should be, which is a, as a fundamental resource in service delivery to our community. And uh, I'm supportive of, of the actions that they uh, propose today. Thank you. Supervisor Fred. Hey, Mr. Chair, I, I actually have to say how nice it was to have all of this in one place. I mean, the scope of projects, we hear about it during the year and, and those that are within our own districts were obviously intimately involved with, but I really appreciated the presentation just to see everything that not only was done this year, but what has been planned for the coming year. I mean, the, the breadth is pretty exceptional. Um, and I, from not just the South County Service Center, which is going to transform our our uh, engagement and relationship with those uh, constituents that have really been underinvested in for a long time in the South County, but also in some of these amazing parks partnerships, just the general needs, the, I mean, the library, the largest investment in libraries in the last 30 years, and then just the general needs across the buildings. It's it's very impressive about the amount of work that's being done. And I think that um, um, we are making some transformational and intergenerational investments in our infrastructure in our community in ways that haven't been done and like i said in about 30 years so very impressive thank you miss daniels by the way for the oversight of the overview of it but but everybody else that presented today it was very helpful and i think we could um also useful to ensure that we communicate this even better just we, we tend to communicate about single projects as they come along which i understand but i think actually presenting this in a more macro perspective could be useful to show what it is that the county has done and what it intends to do in the coming year thank you right very good. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. And uh, yes, thank you to everyone who presented, Mr. Carey, Ms. Daniels, uh, Director Gaffney, and of course, Master of Disaster Response, uh, Director Beaton. Um, a lot of exciting projects and investments here. Um, it's great to see the investments in, in main jail, um, both HVAC, upgrading the generator and, and the control system there that'll um, you know, all ultimately lead to a better environment for anyone um, who's, who's there. Um, the investments in 701 Ocean Street are much needed. Definitely, as I've said, I've, I've seen the uh, the water leaking in through the walls um, and it'd be nice not to have too many buckets in the office uh, this year. Um, I thought I also heard mention that we might be uh, addressing the uh, lighting control system, which would also be most welcome. Um, of course, the investments in, in parks and particularly the Simpkins Swim Center are fantastic. Uh, the, you know, the Moore and Lake restoration and public access plan is not to be understated, uh, given that with sea level rise uh, and the climate crisis, wetland areas like this are really going to be at the forefront uh, of our response. Um, and uh, of the, the library uh, projects, you know, both the Live Oak Library and Live Oak Annex. Um, if, uh, updates are, are going to be really exciting to see uh, the animal shelter renovation um, and, and of course last but not least the South County Service Center I mean there's just so many great investments being made here um, which which will serve us for years to come so thank you for all your good work thank you uh, Supervisor Caput any comments yeah. you bet thank you uh, I want to thank uh, Trish uh, Michael Beaton and Travis uh, for all your work and for this uh, presentation. It was really nice to see the Veterans Memorial Building in one of your um, 
uh, on the screen here. Uh, it looked like 10 years ago that it might be knocked down. Uh, we were able to get it retrofitted and uh, fixed and uh, it has a real emotional uh, attachment to a lot of veterans, uh, especially, well, we've lost all of the World War One veterans in the last uh, few years. Uh, we're losing almost all of our World, World War II veterans, and uh, we still have uh, quite a few Korean War veterans. Uh, so I don't know, Michael, if you're still there, I guess, was that uh, your grandfather that uh, was a veteran? Was he, uh, was he the Korean War or was he World War II? <laughs> yeah, no, he was a World War II uh, tank commander. Um, yeah. yeah. You still have all those letters that he wrote and everything, huh? All 384 of them. Yes, sir, I do. 384. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, something to be proud of. So anyway, that memorial building was basically built for him and uh, all the people that uh, were veterans before. So I'm glad we saved it. And I, it's really nice to see. Thank you. Uh, is Houlihan and Highway 152 look like it's really going to happen? Uh, do we have all the funding or we're, I mean, we've been working on that probably about six, seven years, right? I don't know. Anybody can answer that. That's, that's my understanding. Yeah, I do believe the project is now fully funded and the department does intend to put the project out to bid within the next couple of months. That'll be a big deal uh, for a lot of people in that area. It'll relieve traffic uh, considerably. And I know it's been very complicated. Uh, we, we, we haven't been slow on going that because of our being slow. Uh, we, we've, we face one complication after another. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your work on that. And then uh, real quick on Westridge, wow, <laughs> for South County, that's big. And uh, it's really good to see. So uh, thank you for all the work we've been doing on that. On the main jail, I know we do, we're going to have a lot of money that's going to go into that. And it's uh, uh, the you know generator and the duct cleaning and all that. Is it going to be actually uh, when we're done and all the money we're putting in uh, into it, we're going to actually uh, preserve the jail whereas, where it is, or we're going to have to expand it into another building? Uh, thank you, Supervisor. I'm not sure uh, I can 100% address that that question, uh, but I do know the uh, money that we're putting into the building um, includes uh, uh, systems that I might need to defer to uh, uh, Carlos Palacios regarding the bigger discussion about maintaining the current jail at its current site. Uh, but I know that the control system will be replaced as well as the uh, generator to be able to supply generator to that uh, power to that building on 100%. Uh, we're currently we're only be able to apply 60%. So. Yeah, that'll that'll be a big deal too, uh, because uh, there was talk about uh, that the current facility either fix it or we have to move it right at one time. Yeah, I don't want to open up uh, Pandora's box on that one. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Any comments from the public? Um, you're on mute. Do we have any comments from the public? Uh, we have a connection with Stephanie. Here we go. Sorry about that. Forget about the second kill switch. So there are no members of the public that would like to speak to this item. Okay. I'll return it to the board for uh, recommendation. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Now we will move, uh, we will recess to closed session. Are there any reportable items? There's nothing reportable today, Supervisor. Okay. And do we have a, do we have a different link to get into that or should we just stay? Yes, a, a Teams link. Teams link. Okay. Um, our next meeting, uh, we will recess until Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, you will be able to reach us virtually by Zoom. Uh, we will be discussing the district attorney, public defender, probation, and the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. 
Um, this meeting, we will recess this meeting into closed session and see everyone uh, at 9 a.m. Have a good day.